Uh, yeah, I'm continuing our series from the book of Genesis on the life of Abraham, which we have called um, Journey into Faith. And the title I've given this particular sermon is, It's About Relationship. And that will become clear later on. I'm going to read the passage in a minute, but before I do, I just want to ask you a personal question. hope you don't mind. I'm not expecting you to stand up and give an answer. Um, the question is this, do you ever have problems with relatives? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's our nearest and dearest that give us the most problems or the most concerns in life. I guess it's because we love them and we care what happens to them and uh, the things that they say and do are important to us and the effect that their behavior has on us and others. Uh, you know, we get concerns about them from time to time. We're going to see in this passage that I'm going to read in a moment that Abraham had major problems with one of his relatives, his nephew called Lot. And uh, what had happened in the chapter previously is that Abraham and Lot had prospered. And that's interesting in itself. They both prospered. They had uh, lots of animals to look after, herds of animals. And a dispute arose between Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen in that there wasn't enough pasture to go around. So there was a, a quarrel. And Abraham was very gracious about the solution. And he said to Lot, look, you choose where you want to go. If you want to go left, I'll go right. If you want to go right, I'll go left. You choose, which was very noble of him to do that. And Lot decided to go for what seemed to be the best pasture. Unfortunately, it was near a wicked uh, city called Sodom. And he chose to camp near that city, and in fact, he ended up living there, as we shall see in the reading. Again, before the reading, I just want to show you a map to help us understand something of what's going on here. So, this is where the action is largely taking place here, which is Israel today. And at that time, Abraham was living in Hebron. And when the dispute arose... Lot decided to go to the east. This is the River Jordan, to the east of the River Jordan, to live here. And this is where Sodom was. And over here on our right, we've got five uh, cities here. And uh, the background is this, that these five kings who ruled this area got tribute from the five kings here. So the four kings here got tribute from the five kings here. In other words, the red team got tribute from the green team. And they, that happened for 12 years. But then the, the guys here decided that they would rebel. They'd rebel against the eastern rulers. And as a result of that, the eastern rulers were not happy. So they came up, probably up here, and then down to attack these various cities. So these cities in white were all attacked and sacked. And the ones down in the south and white, they were all attacked and sacked by these four kings, and then there was a battle with these five kings, including the king of Sodom, where Lot was living. This is important to the story. And the five kings were defeated by the eastern kings, and they sacked the cities, they took all the goods from the cities, they took the people into slavery and journeyed north to go back to their homeland. When Abraham heard about it, he was not happy, and he decided to do something about it. So that is the background to the passage that I'm going to read, and I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 14, and I hope that was clear. If not, please forgive me for not being clear enough. Uh, Genesis chapter 14, I'm going to read from verse 11 to the end of the chapter, and it goes like this. The four kings, in other words, those kings from the east, seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot, and his possessions, since he was living in Sodom. One who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Anna, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night... Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot, 
and his possessions together with the women and the other people. <clears throat> After Abram returned from defeating Kedarlaomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Anna, Eshkel, and Mamre. Let them have <clears throat> their share. So it's about relationship. And I asked you the question, uh, do you ever have any problems with some of your relatives? Well, I want to ask you uh, an opposite question. This time I want to ask you this question. Uh, do you have people in your life who do you good? Are there people in your life whose presence lifts you up <clears throat> and strengthens you? Last year, Joy and I had two of our Nepali visitors our leaders of the church in Kathmandu, they came over here for a couple of weeks, and they stayed with us. And uh, I guess Joy and I have, you know, we live on our own. Our children are old enough to have left home. Well, that's the theory anyway. If you've got older children, you know what I'm talking about. It's called the bounce back effect, but that's another story. Um, anyway, we've got kind of used to living on our own, but nevertheless, uh, Amos and Jen came over, and I have to say they were great company. They really were. Um, they loved and appreciated everything we did for them, and they were just good guys to have around, men of good presence. It was a pleasure to have them. Do you have people on your side? It's very strengthening, isn't it, to know that others are for you. People who seek your welfare and your good, and they want to encourage you. I'm not talking about flattery uh, and insincerity, but genuineness. In fact, they may even tell us off kindly. But they can do that because they've built a strong bridge of relationship. I don't know if I made this up or whether I read it somewhere or heard it. I don't know, but I love this phrase. I hope it makes sense to you without too much explanation. Again, uh, if it doesn't, please forgive me. You can take a five-ton elephant across a ten-ton bridge, but you can't take a ten-ton elephant across a five-ton bridge. You know, the point of that is this, that we need to seek, not just seek, we need to do it. We need to build strong relationships with godly people. The poet John Donne wrote this, no man is an island entire of itself. And he's absolutely true. In other words, we're not self-sufficient. We need others, and others need us. Well, you might say, I'm not very good at this relationship stuff, <laughs> or I've been hurt in the past. Well, that's true of you, what I want to say is this, join the club. You know, um, so have I. But the point is this, you may feel you're not very good at relationship, but I want to encourage you and say this, that God is at work within you to make you willing and able to obey his purpose. You see, I expect in this account that I've just read that uh, it wasn't very pleasant for Lot and his family to be carted off to a foreign country, into slavery. And I expect as a result of that, he was jolly glad to see his uncle Abram turn up. Let's face it, Lot was very foolish to go and live uh, in Sodom in the first place, that wicked place. But nevertheless, even when he was rescued, he decided to go back there. But Abram, throughout Lot's life, as far as we know, was a very good relative and friend to him. What was it that made Abram such a good guy? Well, he worshipped the Lord for a start. We see often in the account of Abraham that he built an altar, and he was someone who worshipped the Lord. And as a result of that, if you worship the Lord, that's going to bring you into a good place. There's no doubt about that. 
That's going to affect your life. It says, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. We all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed from one degree of glory to another by the Spirit. So when we draw near to God in worship, something happens. It's not just us offering worship to God. God comes and he meets with us. His presence comes and he touches us and he affects us. And certainly with Abraham, he was a worshiper of the Lord. And I think that was a key factor in the, that made him a good guy, a good person to have. He also took God's word seriously, as we shall see in a moment, and he acted on it. <clears throat> you see, when Abraham heard about Lot's capture into slavery, I don't expect that was a blessing. It was terrible news. You know, you're, someone came and told him the city's been sacked, it's been ransacked. You know, all these cities have been defeated by these four kings from the east. And not only that, but your nephew and all his family, they've all been carted, and all their possessions have all been carted off into slavery. That was not a blessing. In fact, it was more like a curse. And what was it that God had said to Abram anyway? Previously, in the previous chapter, he said this, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. You see, I'm sure <clears throat> that that gave Abram confidence to go into battle to go to war. After all, he had 318 men. The odds were not very good against these four kings who'd already defeated countless cities, ransacked them, defeated the five kings around the Dead Sea. But here he is. He goes off, and I think he goes off strengthened through his relationship with God, and therefore, he was able to help a lot. You know, we too, we need to be encouraged in our relationship with God in order to be a blessing to others. You know, we all need godly people in our lives to help us. And that's one of the reasons why we are promoting our small groups. We see it's a very vital part of what it means to be a Christian. It's one of the primary ways in which we encourage relationships within the church. And if you haven't, you see, you could say, well, Ron, I know, you've, you know you're a leader here. You're well-established here. You've been coming here for donkey's years. Well, of course you've got good relationships. Of course you've got godly relationships. And that's true. But I had to start somewhere. You, you have to start somewhere. And when I started, the very first time I went to a meeting at Living Waters up in Penn, I knew nobody. Nobody at all. I went in, there were complete strangers. So you have to start somewhere. You know, I haven't got to the place of godly relationships that I have now by chance. It's taken time, it's taken dedication, it's taken effort, it's taken forgiveness. You know, it's taken many things to do that. It's taken overlooking faults, and I mean other people overlooking my faults. There are a few. So we take time in order to build a relationship. Abraham was a good guy. He, needed have, he could have washed his hands a lot. He could have said, good riddance to him. He's been nothing but trouble since we left Ur of the Chaldees, leave him to his own devices. But he didn't. And later on in the story, we'll read that Lot gets in a mess again, and Abram comes to his rescue. So it's about relationship. The second thing I really want to say is God is with us. And John's spoken that before. Emmanuel, we, we talked about that at Christmas time. Emmanuel, God is with us. In verse 17 in this chapter, it says, after Abram returned from defeating Kedaloma and the kings allied with him, <clears throat> the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. <clears throat> he was priest of God most high. So here we see this mysterious figure called Melchizedek coming into, God's, uh, into Abram's life. In other words, God brings someone into Abram's life who is going to bless him and encourage him. I wonder, is our God any different? No, he's the same God. He brings someone into Abraham's life in order to bless him and encourage him. Now, just a few words of explanation about this mysterious figure, Melchizedek, that you know, I've read about many times and wondered about him. Very interesting that the writer here deliberately does not give Melchizedek's lineage. In other words, he doesn't say who uh, Melchizedek's ancestors were or his descendants. Very often in the Old Testament, when someone is introduced, their uh, ancestors are given and their descendants are given. Here, they're not given at all, and that is deliberate. 
One of the reasons it's deliberate is because it takes him out. He's a priest, but it takes him out of the Levitical priesthood. The Levitical priesthood under the law of Moses, you had to be a Levite to be a priest. You had to be of that tribe in order to be a priest. Now, the writer here deliberately does not say what Melchizedek's tribe is. So he's, and he just does that deliberately to show that he's outside the Levitical priesthood. Just hang on in there. Slightly complicated. I'll try and make it as simple as I can here. Also, the reason that he does not say who his ancestors are and his descendants are is to give an indication of no beginning and no end. It's symbolic. It's symbolic as he does not give his ancestors or descendants. It's as if he's appeared out of nowhere. He's got no beginning and no end. That's how it appears. It's symbolic, though, of something else. He blesses Abram. The greater blessing the lesser. Again, there's a point to all of this. It's symbolic. Abram also gives to him. Abram honors him. Again, there's a point to that. There's something symbolic about that. And Melchizedek is also king of Salem. He is king of peace. And he's also king of righteousness. Well, it's all pointing to someone else. Someone who does not have a beginning and an end. Someone who is not in the Levitical priesthood of the law, but is outside that. Someone who is king of righteousness and king of peace. Someone greater than this figure who, is, who has appeared to Abram. See, like many things in the Old Testament, Melchizedek, I hope you're hanging on in there. It's slightly complicated, I don't know, but never mind. Melchizedek is a shadow. The Bible talks about things in the Old Testament being shadows of the reality that's revealed in the New Testament. Let me give you some examples of that. The Holy of Holies in the temple was a shadow of the greater reality, which is heaven itself. This is all explained in the book of Hebrews. The high priest offering blood as an atonement once a year is a shadow of Christ, the greater high priest, entering into heaven itself. The curtain in the temple that separates the holy of holy place from the outer parts of the temple, that thick curtain that divided and separated people from the holiest place of all, and only the high priest was allowed to go in. That curtain which was torn from top to bottom, it's a shadow of the fact that when Christ died, his body was broken, his blood was shed, and the way was then open. So here, with Melchizedek, it's not Christ pre-incarnate. You may disagree, and you're at liberty to do so, but my reading is, it's not Christ pre-incarnate, but it's a man. He is a king, and he's a king of that place called Salem, which commentators say is Jerusalem. But it's a shadow, a type of the reality of the Son of God. That's what it is, who was to come. Be that as it may, and I hope you've hang on in there, thought that was worth explaining. The point I want to make is this, that God sent someone to Abram because the battle, in another sense, is not yet won. And hopefully there'll be time to go into that a little bit later. <clears throat> the battle is not yet fully won. Slavery has just become topical again because of the film, 12 Years a Slave. And there's just reading on the news this week, there's been a call to uh, have it, the education about slavery in the national curriculum. William Wilberforce, who was very instrumental in having slavery abolished in this country and throughout the then British Empire, he was a member of parliament when he became a Christian. And when he became a Christian, he was wondering whether he, he should quit Parliament or not. And uh, he had a friend called John Newton. And John Newton, some of you may know, was a former slave trader whose life had turned out. He'd become a Christian. He was a minister of the gospel. He wrote Amazing Grace. And he said to William Wilberforce, <clears throat> God has raised you up for the good of the church and the good of the nation. Continue in Parliament. Who knows that but for such a time as this, God has brought you into public life and has a purpose for you. I mean, 
William Wilberforce's battle to have slavery abolished went on for decades. It was over 20 years. And it's difficult for us to imagine the opposition that he faced at the time. But as I've been reading up about it, one of the things that I discovered was that slavery in the sort of late 18th, early 19th century, to this country, it was worth a huge amount of money. It was worth as much uh, as the housing market is today. So if you could imagine if there was no housing market, if the housing market in this country collapsed 100%, can you imagine the economic effect that that would have on the country? One of the indicators, I think, and I'm no economist, uh, but I think one of the indicators as to whether the country is climbing out of recession is the housing market, how well it's doing. Because if you move house, you may buy stuff, and you know, there's a lot of money involved in it. So if that collapsed, it would have a devastating effect on the economy. So slavery at the time that William Wilberforce was there was a huge battle, and he suffered many defeats. Had he tried to do it on his own, I'm sure he would have failed. <clears throat> With his last letter, John Wesley also wrote to him, and he wrote this. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might till even American slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, shall vanish away before it. So God brought these guys into William Wilberforce's life in order to strengthen him. God brought the king of Salem, Melchizedek, into Abraham's life in order to strengthen him. It's all about relationship. And it's about God showing that he's with us. How do we know that God is with us? One of the ways in which we know that God is with us is he brings godly people into our life to help us, strengthen us, encourage us, and do us good. Three days before he died, William Wilberforce saw slavery abolished in 1833, I think it was. Melchizedek comes and blesses Abraham. So Christ comes and blesses us. And by the way, can I just pause here for a moment and just say thank you very much to, I could pick out many people sitting in this congregation who over the years have been there for not just me, but for Joy and me, not just for Joy and me, but for our family. Thank you so much. And have there been struggles? (laughs) A few. Have there been disappointments? A few. Have there been battles? Yeah, do you want to see the scars? And without you, even this, was it Saturday or Friday that we came to your house? Friday. Went to our dear friends, Alec and Sandra, whom we've known for donkey's years. And uh, you know the encouragement that we get from them and from many of you, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And I've said this many times, but I want to say it again. Your presence matters. And that's not just to our dear friends, but your presence matters. You matter. You know, the devil says to you, you don't matter. It's a lie. The devil says, you've got nothing to contribute. It's a lie. It is a lie. Your presence matters. Who you are matters. What you bring to the table matters. And with our small groups, it's not just a matter of going and receiving. Yes, we do. But it's also who you bring to the table. It's so important. You know, we are the body of Christ. You know, that analogy is used purposefully. You know, we are connected to one another. John Donne was absolutely right. No man is an island. You know, my finger doesn't suddenly detach itself from its hand and scarper across the floor. It just doesn't happen. And I would say to you, I would just encourage you, if somehow, for whatever reason, and I don't want to go into it, it's not my business anyway, if for any reason you find yourself in a position of isolation, then I would say, just ask the Lord to help you get out of it, and quickly. You don't want to be in a position of isolation. You may not be very good at forming relationships, but nevertheless, God will help you. God will bless you. God will encourage you. 
<clears throat> Melchizedek comes and he does exactly that to Abraham. He encourages him. It says, them, then Melchizedek came, uh, sorry, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Verse 18. Very symbolic. I don't expect that they knew the symbolism of what they were doing. I don't expect they did. The apostle Peter tells us about the prophets of old long to know what the Spirit of God was saying and doing in them when they were the Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalmist didn't know that this was, he might have had an inkling in some shape or form, but he didn't know that was Jesus Christ suffering and dying on the cross and feeling abandoned. He didn't know that. He, it says the prophets, they longed to find out. It's the same here. The king of Salem brought bread and wine. I don't think they knew the significance of that. Post Christ, the era in which we live, we do know that. <clears throat> It's symbolic what's, what's going on here as, a, as Melchizedek does this for Abraham. His, the body and blood of Christ, we know that's what it is now. And it shows us, it demonstrates to us Jesus' commitment to us. Melchizedek comes and blesses Abraham. Well, somebody greater than Melchizedek comes and blesses you and blesses me. It's Jesus himself, the Christ. And whenever we break bread, we remember that. Jesus comes, and as he sacrifices his life, as he sheds his blood, the blessing of Almighty God gets poured out upon us. The, the veil in the temple is torn in two. The way to heaven is open, and the blessing of God can flow into our lives. Isn't it true? If I was to say to you, are you blessed? Have you been blessed? You have to say, yes, I've been blessed. I've been blessed in many ways. I know that life is not all sorted. I know that. You know, I've been long in the tooth enough. I'm not saying that everything is roses in the garden, but nevertheless, we're blessed. You know, we're blessed with our salvation. Jesus, when that veil was torn and he opened the way to him, we're blessed with our salvation. We have a destiny that we never had before. We have a purpose in life that we never had before. We have his presence, we have his spirit, we have his word, we have his people. God has done many things, good things in our life. Melchizedek comes and he blesses Abraham. Jesus comes and his blessing is powerful upon us. But just as Abraham was blessed, it wasn't so that he could just get blessed and get rich and get fat. No, it was so that that blessing would be poured out to others. Through you, all the nations will be blessed. How encouraging it is to hear Chris's testimony this morning. How the Lord spoke to him. And he was, you know, is it me? Is it the Spirit? As we often do. But bless you, Chris. You got out of the boat and uh, you went down that alley and you met that man. It's wonderful. It's to be a blessing to others. Melchizedek blesses Abraham and God blesses us. Emmanuel, he's with us. I wonder if we could just stop for a moment. And say together, thank you, Lord, that you're with me. Yeah? Because it's true. Let's do that. After three. One, two, three. Thank you, Lord, that you're with me. And thank you, Lord, that you are for me. Just like Melchizedek was for Abraham. It's a sign. It's a symbol. God is for us. We are the descendants of Abraham if we are the people of faith. Melchizedek comes and blesses Abraham. Christ comes and blesses us. Thank you, Lord, that you're for me. Let's say that together after three. One, two, three. Thank you, Lord, that you are for me. It's true, isn't it? We need others in the battle. That's the final point I want to make. The king of Sodom comes out. He's a cheeky so-and-so. And he says to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. What a cheek. Actually, the goods and the people were the right of the conqueror. And Abraham was the conqueror. You know, the king of Sodom was defeated, you know, face flat on the ground, as it were, and he's got the nerve to come and say to Abraham, I'll tell you what, I'll have this and you have that. As if he's being magnanimous. He isn't. He's uh, trying it on. But Abraham is, you know, Abraham has been blessed. He doesn't need anything from the king of Sodom. And it's very interesting that the king of uh, uh, Melchizedek comes and he says to Abram, Blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. He tells uh, Abram where his victory has really come from. God has done it. And he refers to 
God as the creator of heaven and earth when he talks to Abraham. And Abraham, when he talks to the king uh, of Sodom, how does he refer to God? Exactly the same words. Creator of heaven and earth. He gets blessed and he gets strengthened by the coming of Melchizedek. And then he's faced with this temptation to cozy up to the king of Solomon, Sodom, to cozy up to the, one of the rulers of that area, area to get in his good books, to get a, a good PR, as it were. That's the temptation. To get even richer, that's the temptation. But he refuses to do it. He's been strengthened. He's been encouraged by someone else. And then when the temptation comes, he speaks with the same words that he's heard from Melchizedek, creator of heaven and earth. We know that God is with us. We know that God can strengthen us in a moment of time, regardless of anybody. You could be on a desert island out in the South Pacific, not even Bear Grylls with you, and be there on your own, and God could strengthen you. Yes, of course he can. But actually, you're not on a desert island, as far as I'm aware. You're in the High Wycombe and the environs. And we need godly people of good presence with whom we have patiently built a 10-ton bridge. I was reading again about Paul and Epaphroditus. The Apostle Paul, a mighty man of God, you think, well, he wouldn't need anybody. He went off and God spoke to him uh, for many years on his own and he was imprisoned and shipwrecked. And, but he needed people. And he said Epaphroditus almost died. He said, but God spared him to stop adding to my suffering. And, I, and I'm blessed by him. Paul knew what it was to have godly relationships. I just want to finish by saying, who's in your camp? Who have you got on your side? Yeah, we've got Jesus, I know that. But I'm talking about godly men and women of faith who will be there for us, who will encourage us, who will strengthen us just as Melchizedek came at this crucial part of Abraham's life, and he blessed him. An important part of our faith journey is our relationship with other believers. It takes time. We have to invest. And God will use others to be a blessing to us. Amen.